I want to talk to you this morning about really something that is a, a, a part of the routine of our life. Just about every conversation uh, we have every day ends up with this. Either giving or receiving advice. I mean, stop and think about it. It's, you hardly get into any conversation with anyone for any length of time that before the conversation ends, either you are saying, well, why don't you think about doing this? Or you're hearing, well, have you thought about trying that? I mean, it's just a normal routine and part of life, isn't it? Let me get you to think with me for just a minute. I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. What's the best advice you've ever been given? It can be about life, it can be about relationship, about marriage, about parenting, about work, about God, just whatever. What's the best advice you've ever received in your life? You got it? You got it? All right. You have 30 seconds to tell the person next to you what that is because they'll be smarter as a result of it. Okay, 30 seconds, 15 seconds each. Go. Best advice you've ever received. That's enough. So, some of you enjoyed that way too much. I've been wanting to tell him that for years. So okay. enjoyed it way, way, uh, way too much. But it is a part of the give and flow of life. I mean, it really is. Uh, I uh, sent an email out to all the staff uh, probably about 10 days ago and uh, just said, listen, what's, I asked them that question. What's the best advice you've ever, uh, uh, you've ever been given? And I had several pages <clears throat> I think folks felt like I needed a lot of advice, several pages of advice, but I uh, pulled from that uh, some of the highlights that I, that I, that I thought uh, you would enjoy. Uh, uh, one of our ladies on the staff team said, never eat yellow snow. <laughs> we had a couple on our staff, this is a one you'll be familiar with, you can't outgive God. Uh, one lady said, you don't have to explain what you don't say. It's not one of my gifts. <laughs> okay. Remember whose you are. One fellow wrote, listen, don't wait to talk. One fellow wrote, know what you don't know. Now this one, I'm not going to give names to these, but I, uh, the person who sent this one to me oversees our marriage mentoring ministry. That's important in context. Here was his best advice ever given. As a husband, you can be right or you can be married, but you can't be both. <laughs> One lady wrote, sometimes you just have to talk stupid to stupid people. Okay. No context intended. Okay. Uh, one lady wrote, we've heard it, God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. And then the last one, which is very close to where we're going uh, in our uh, teaching time this morning. Never listen to what others say, only listen to what he says. Trust and obey him only. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Good advice. Good advice. Well, <clears throat> open your Bibles uh, or uh, crank up your device to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Let me set it in a kind of context and place and uh, setting. We'll have the words on the screen here in, uh, in just a minute as I read uh, the text. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Jesus is launching his public ministry for about the next three years. He's been in the home of Mary and Joseph. Joseph, I think, uh, had passed away by now, and Jesus had really taken up the family, uh, uh, family business. But Mary had watched him uh, grow up. Uh, he's reached adulthood, and uh, he uh, uh, had experienced uh, obedience in baptism uh, uh, by John. He had experienced the wilderness temptations. All that's taken place up to this point. In John chapter 1, uh, Jesus calls uh, uh, the first of his disciples in John, in uh, Andrew, in Peter, in Philip, and in Nathaniel. And Nathaniel was from Cana. Cana is where we are when we come to John chapter 2. In John chapter 2, Jesus is in Cana at a wedding feast. Cana is just a few miles, we don't know exactly where it is, but just a few miles from Nazareth, Jesus' hometown. Jesus uh, is, you know, is still, you know, an unknown. He's just worked in his dad's uh, business, uh, you know, since his dad had, uh, had, had passed away. And Mary, you know, had come to a greater discovery of who he was. But uh, Jesus uh, shows up at this wedding feast in Cana of Galilee and performs, which I think is uh, uh, quite interesting, of all places that he could have chosen as the venue for his coming out, as it were, uh, 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 for his first miracle was uh, at a wedding feast in Cana of Galilee, a place of joy and celebration and festivity, and uh, that's where he does this. And it's the first of his signs, John says, in confirming, he always did miracles to confirm who he was and also to elicit faith and trust in his ability to transform those of us who would trust him. And to change us. That was always what was behind uh, the, uh, uh, the miracle. So with that background, uh, uh, follow along as I read through John chapter 2, the first 11 verses. On the third day, and I think that's probably the third day after the calling of Nathaniel, going back into chapter 1. There was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. And the mother of Jesus, that would be Mary, uh, 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 mother of Jesus was there. Jesus was also invited and to the wedding with his disciples. Now, I don't know if the disciples had been invited. Maybe they were the cause of the problem. You know, I don't know. Maybe uh, it was a small wedding party and Jesus shows up with five extra bodies and they were heavy drinkers. And I don't want to go there. But uh, th there were issues. And maybe that created the problem. But verse 3, when the wine ran out, when the wine ran out, it does that in life, doesn't it? It does that in life. Things occur we didn't plan on. The unexpected happens. Problems, issues, difficulties, surprises arrive maybe many times a day, but certainly many times in our lives. The wine runs out. So when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, so Mary may have some kind of responsibility here or maybe he knows the bridegroom or both, I'm not sure. And Mary says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone jar, uh, water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification for uh, uh, ceremonies, washing feet and, uh, and washing hands uh, before the meal, during the meal, uh, between courses and after uh, the meal, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. <coughs> Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars. Again, now Jesus is a relatively unknown. Fill the jars with water and they fill them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. Once they're snuckered, they just show them the cheap stuff. It's in the white space, but I know that's what he means. Okay. <laughs> but you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. 
Now, go back to verse 5. And Mary said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Is that not the best advice ever given? I mean, think about it. I mean, it's it's instructive, it's powerful, it's life-changing and transforming. There may be no better advice than simply saying to someone or receiving for yourself, do whatever he, Jesus, tells you to do. I mean, in those five words is the best advice ever given. How so? Well, first of all, because of who's giving it. Okay, this is not Mary. Mary is simply giving us advice about where to go for advice. She's pointing us in the right direction. She didn't go to the groom. By the way, this is a wedding. It was a huge social event. It lasted for approximately a week. It was, it, was, uh, it was social suicide to show up and then for wine or food to run out. So when the wine runs out, Mary, she didn't go to, again, she didn't go to the groom. She didn't go to the groom's parents. She didn't go to the bride. She didn't go to the bride's, bride's parents. She didn't go to the, uh, the, the person who was the wedding coordinator or the master of ceremonies for the feast. I mean, there's a lot of places she could have gone when the wine ran out, when she faced a problem. But where did she go? She went to Jesus. She went to Jesus. Can I ask you a question? Where do you go when the wine runs out? You see, she, she didn't, she went to, all she did was report, we got a problem. She just reported, we have no wine. She didn't tell him what to do. She didn't tell him what was expected of him. She simply reported the problem. Now, that's a little bit different than me and maybe some of us. I have this propensity to tell God what he probably already knows. I know you don't do that, but tell him what he already knows. And then the height, the, the, the height of arrogance is then to tell him what I think he needs to do about what he already knows. Now, not that any of you ever do that, okay? But Mary didn't do that. She just simply went to Jesus and reported the problem. Where do you go when you need wisdom? Where do you go when you need advice? What do you do when the wine runs out what's your modus operandi what do you normally do you get mad at yourself or because you messed up screwed up and you caused it and you beat yourself up do you get mad at God because God didn't come through or do what you wanted him to do or do you consider maybe God just doesn't care or do you maybe assume wrongly that God is angry at you and he's punishing you do you panic do you run do you quit what do you do when the wine runs out in your life, where do you go for advice? Well, Scripture tells us. I want to look at a few passages of Scripture. Most of these you'll be familiar with. They'll be on the screen. I want to begin in the Old Testament with uh, a very familiar passage, especially around Christmas time, where uh, uh, God, uh, speaking to prophet Isaiah, talks about, unto us a child is born. But I find it really interesting that one of the titles, uh, uh, including, as it were, responsibility of Jesus in our lives is, His name shall be called Wonderful what? Counselor. Advisor, Look in the New Testament. Look at this passage out of Romans eleven thirty six. 36. For from him and through him, that's Jesus, and to him are all things. I meant, what doesn't he know? Where can he not speak into our lives? Look at Paul in Colossians 1. This is a great passage uh, about, uh, about Colossians 1, uh, several verses here. He is the image, this is Jesus, of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. By him, all things were created. You think that might include you and me? You think you were a surprise to God? No. He created you long time before your parents produced you. God created you. You're not a surprise, no matter who you are. God knows you exactly as you are, and he's, 
He is in charge of what's going on. He created us in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities. All things were created through him, including us, and for him. Read on. He, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Listen, there are no surprises to God. When the wine runs out, God's never surprised in your life and my life. He is, he is orchestrating events in order to make us the person that he wants us to be in the image of Christ. He is the head of the body of the church, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything, why does he do this? Why does he allow the wine run out? Why does he allow the difficulties in our life? Why does he do that? That we might put him where? First, preeminent in our lives. Read on. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on heaven or on earth, making peace by the blood of the cross. Okay? And then one more out of Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. I mean, I could go on pulling verses from Old and New Testament about who is giving this advice. It is Jesus. Who lives in you and me when we come into a relationship with God? When we trust Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live in us. Does he not? He lives in a God. All the fullness of God dwells in Jesus and all the fullness of God dwells in us. And one of the reasons he does is to provide us the best advice ever given. I know that it's not always easy, but it is always best. I mean, who has more wisdom? Look at Paul in Colossians, excuse me, in 1 Corinthians. There are two verses there. Look at verse 24 and 30. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the what? The wisdom of God. You need wisdom. You got a decision you need to make. You need to know what God wants you to do. You need to know uh, what he tell, needs to, wants you to do for him to obey him. Relationship, whatever the case may be. There it is, the wisdom of God. Look at verse 30. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us what? Wisdom. Wisdom. Who has more wisdom? Tell me. Who has more power and authority? Tell me. Who has more grace? Who loves us more than anyone? No one. Who has our best interest in mind? He does. I mean, do whatever he tells you to do. Not what you want to do. Why? Because it only complicates things. I don't know about you, but every time I stick my life into my life, I mess it up. <laughs> and evidently some of you do as well. It rarely gets better if we don't start with Him. I mean, this is so simple it's, it, that it can be profound. When you run out of wine, don't get angry, don't panic, don't quit, don't run, don't take matters into your own hands. That only complicates things and probably will make them worse. Do what Mary did. Report to Jesus. Report to him. He already knows what's going on there. Report to him. The very reporting says, I need help. I can't manage this on my own. And report to him. You say, but Jimmy, sometimes I have a, I really struggle determining God's voice. Is, is God, is he telling me to do something? Well, I believe God does speak. No, we don't have what Mary had that day with Jesus standing literally physically right there. And she turns to the servant and says, do whatever he tells you to do. But I believe that God has left us enough resources and information that you and I can discern what God wants us to do. As I said, the Holy Spirit lives in every one of us who knows Christ. And one of the things he wants to do in your life and my life is provide the wisdom of God and give us direction for whatever God's plan and purpose is for every given situation in life. And he speaks to us. He speaks to us through uh, a, a message. He speaks to us through a life group. He speaks to us through his word when we read that on our own. He speaks to us, yes, he does, through the counsel of others. Over and over and over again in the book of Proverbs, it says there's wisdom in many counselors. Uh, there's safety and guidance in, in, in many uh, wise and godly counselors. He 
speaks to us through the circumstances of life. He speaks to us when we get before him and we pray. Say, Lord, I've got this issue. I know it doesn't catch you by surprise, but I need to know what you want me to do. I've run out of wine in this area of my life. Please show me what to do. I mean, last night at the end of the service, I had a gentleman uh, 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 catch me afterwards and said, listen, I'm still, uh, I'm still having difficulty determining uh, if God is telling, uh, uh, telling me to do something. And I said, well, tell me your story. He said, well, I've spent most of my adult life uh, working in restaurants and serving tables. Okay? Uh, I lost my job uh, uh, some months ago, and I had put some money aside, so uh, I... Uh, I went away and visited family in St. Louis for a while, and I came back, and uh, I started going quite regularly to a, to a Cracker Barrel. God bless him. I tried to go into a Cracker Barrel, and uh, I got to become real good friends with a manager. Real good friends with a manager. And he said, I went back to visit my family in St. Louis, and I came back, and I moved to the other side of Orlando. I moved out uh, to the uh, Claremont area. And uh, I, was, I was not near the, uh, uh, the uh, Cracker Barrel I used to go to, so I went the one out at the Grove Mall at the Groves. And I walk in, and he's there. And he's the new manager there, and I just live just a few minutes away. And he said, I'm trying to decide whether or not that I might need to ask him about work. And I said, let me get this straight. <laughs> You serve tables. He has tables. You know him. Okay, you know what? Listen, and I said to him, have you asked him for a job? And he said, no. <laughs> and I said, really? Really? I said, you might want to ask him for a job. See, God, God can orchestrate things, but sometimes we miss it. And it's not because God's not transmitting, okay? We've dropped the call. We've dropped the call. My God, we've dropped the call. We dropped the call because we got hurry disease. Hello. We dropped the call because we're too busy about our lives. Remember what, remember what the Father said at the transfiguration of Jesus? He said, this is my beloved Son. Listen to him. If you're always busy, it's hard to listen. It's hard to listen. I tell you another reason sometimes we, we, we drop the call, as it were, as God's trying to speak into our lives what we need to do in a given uh, situation is that sometimes we get too concerned about what we want God to bless than what we want God to do. By that I mean we want to tell God, here's what needs to happen in this situation. Would you please okay that? Would you please bless that and make that okay? Rather than, God, what is it that you want me to do? And there is a significant difference. And asking God what is his will as opposed to telling him, here's my will, will you bless it? This is the best advice ever given. Foremost because of who is giving it. There is no greater source of wisdom. There's a second, go to him. That's what, that's what Mary is showing us, go to him. You know one of the greatest blessings, one of the greatest blessings you and I have as a follower of Christ is that when the wine runs out, we really do have someone to go to who really cares and who really will be there. And who really will work? And remember, all about it's all about your and my being changed and transformed. It's not about the wine, it's about us being transformed and changed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Look at the next thing. What does, what does this include? What does this advice include? Notice he says, do, what's the next word? Whatever. You know, I thought about whatever, and I think it goes in two directions. I think Mary, when she says to the servant, do whatever he tells you, is saying, just, you know, be all in. <laughs> uh, you know, be committed. To, uh, be committed whatever he tells you to do. Totally in. Don't do it partially. Don't argue about it. Don't bargain about it. Don't demand. Just do You got to remember these servants, they don't even know, who is this guy? Who is this guy? 
I mean, what do, I mean, they may have known who Mary was, they may have known Jesus was her son, but for him to give those kind of instructions, they wonder, what is, what is going on here? Whatever. But be totally committed to whatever it is he tells you to do. Don't negotiate. Don't negotiate. Don't argue and don't bargain. And they didn't. We'll get to that in just a minute. They didn't. They did whatever he told them to do. And the second thing I think has to do with the content of whatever. Here it was about turning water into wine to, to meet the needs of those who were there. But for you and me, whatever can be really pervasive. Really pervasive. You know, I happen to believe when the Bible says that Jesus is the wisdom of God, it really teaches it means that. And that there's not any issue in life that you and I face maritally, parentally, vocationally, financially, physically that you and I face in life that Jesus can't meet us at that point of need. Not a one. Because ultimately every problem I have is God's problem. Because he cares that much about you and me. No one is more interested in my welfare, in my being. No one is, loves me more. No one has more wisdom. He is there to meet me at my point of need. Whatever, whatever it may be. So what is it this morning you need some advice from God on? Is it marriage? Is it another relationship? Is it vocation? Is it work related? Is it family related? Is it financial? Is it physical? Is it, is it spiritual? Is it about baptism? Have you followed him in baptism and obedience uh, uh, by immersion after salvation? That's what next weekend is about as we celebrate the resurrection. The early church is only baptized once a year and that was on Easter. Don't miss it if you need to be baptized. Make it, make it known at the end of the service. You know, last, one of the things that I watched last week is I watched so many of you come into the renovated worship service and uh, worship center and, and drop your cards in and some of you will do that today. That, what, do whatever he tells you to do about all in. Listen, you can't go wrong. It's the best advice ever given. Do whatever. Do whatever he tells you and it'll be right. It doesn't mean it'll be easy. I mean, look, what does this require? What does this require? Look at the first word in these five words that she says to him. What is it? Do. That's spelled D-O. Do. Whose part is that? Ours. I'm afraid too often many of us want God to solve our problems. And yet we don't want to have a responsibility in it. He doesn't usually work that way. He can, but he doesn't usually work that way. There's a cooperative effort going on here between the movement of God and the submission and obedience of you and me. And Mary knew that. Listen, Mary, Jesus had not done any miracles. Yet she had made a, uh, was making a wonderful discovery about who he was. But he had not done anything miraculous. I mean, for her to say to those servants, do whatever he tells you. And for those servants to do that, I mean, look at verse 7. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they argued with him. They discussed it among themselves whether or not to do it. No, and it says they what? They filled them to the brim. I mean, there are six of these things. 20, 30 gallons each. That's a lot of trips to the well. I mean, think about it. I don't know how close the well was. And they filled them all up to the brim. And the servants do that for really someone they don't even know or hardly know. And then he says, once they do that, now... He says, I want you to take some to the wedding coordinator. Now, they put it in a ladle. They had a plastic ladle then as well. Because uh, the reason is, I mean, think about this. What do they do with this? They wash their feet and wash their hands. You don't want to say, hey, wedding coordinator, want to drink? You don't want to go there. Okay? So they take a ladle of the wine to him, just like Jesus told him to do. No questions asked. I got to tell you, you know what one of my problems is? I ask a lot of questions. Do you do that? You know, God, thank you for being honest. Everybody else is a liar, but thank you for being honest. Okay. You know, I mean, I don't know, but God and I are, 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 are in these ongoing discussions all the time. Okay? And I lose. Do you? It just takes me a while to get there. 
Okay, takes me a while to, uh, to process through. But do whatever he tells you to do. And that's exactly what I want my response to be. And I believe you do too, to be just like Mary's and no servant. They didn't know. They didn't have a clue what Jesus could do or would do. They didn't. And they trusted him anyways. That's where I want to be. That's where we all need to be. Lord, I've got this issue, not caught to you by surprise. I am out of wine in this area of my life. I need to know what you want me to do. And then to listen, and then when he speaks, do it. Don't argue, don't do it partially. Don't say, I want to do this and not that. Just do it. Just do it. And when we do, and when we follow this advice, the best advice ever given, what happens? I mean, it's, 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 it's unbelievable. First of all, a social catastrophe was averted. I mean, to run out of wine, like I said, wine and food, had a wedding feast that went on for days, okay, uh, was, 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 uh, was a terrible thing to happen, both to the bride's family and to the groom's family. So Jesus intervenes, okay, and the social catastrophe doesn't take place. The second thing that happens is there's plenty for everybody. There's an abundance. There's a lot. Let me kind of put it in perspective, okay? Each of these, say, is 25 gallons. This is to take the average. That's 150 gallons, okay? 150 gallons. Uh, How many bottles of wine is that? Okay, not that you know. Not that you know. But I know. Okay, all right. I did my homework, okay? 757 bottles of wine. They had all they wanted. Maybe more than they needed, but they had all that they wanted and probably some to take home in a brown bag. They had plenty. But when we take God's advice, that's what happens. We get more than we ever expected. How about how good was the wine? It was the best. It was the best. You know what happens when we do whatever he tells us? That's what happens. We get the best. We get the best. You know what else happens? Look at verse, look at verse uh, 11. This was the first of the signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. His disciples believed in him. But he'd already called five of those disciples. They had already believed in him. This is not about a salvation of belief. This is about a faith and growth and persevering and trusting faith in him. See, every time God comes through and turns our water into wine, our faith goes up. Our confidence goes up. Our belief in him goes up. And that's exactly what he wants. And that's exactly what happened here. And then most importantly of all, it says, and manifested his glory. The glory of God was revealed. Listen, when we are willing to do what Jesus tells us to do, then we will get what only Jesus can do. Let me say that again. When we are willing to do what Jesus tells us to do, then we will get what only Jesus can do can do. That's the truth. Is not this the best advice ever given? Do whatever he tells you. About 30 minutes ago, I asked you to think of the best advice you've ever been given. Then I asked you to turn to your neighbor and to share with one another that puny advice. I want to close the service, but I want you to go back to your neighbor. And I'm not giving you 30 seconds. You only need about 10. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to look, the neighbor, the person next to you, whoever you spoke to, and I want you to look them in the face, and I want you to say this to them. Do whatever he tells you. All right? Go. Go.